Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our epistle lesson, Philippians chapter 2. Is there any encouragement in belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Knowing Christ and His salvation makes us thankful, hopeful, and optimistic in the best sense. These are the words from a song called With a Thankful Heart. With a thankful heart, with will be nephew and niece to me, will bring love, hope, and peace to me. Yes, and every night will end, and every day will start with a grateful prayer and a thankful heart. Paul, in our text, has given the Philippians a prayer of thanks. He's commended them for their example of love to others. He told them, He expected to be released from prison, but released or not, his confidence was high and he was good. He was good because Jesus Christ is Lord and Jesus Christ had claimed Paul as his own. Now Paul wants to build up the Philippians and he uses a common tool that the Greek debaters would use, the if-then form of argument. If this is true, then this must be true as well. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Here we have a series of if statements. Is there any encouragement in belonging to Christ? Yes. Is there any comfort in His love? Of course. Any fellowship in the Spirit? Yes. Then, if those statements are true, your hearts should be tender and compassionate. You should have the same mind and love. You should get along with each other and have common goals. You should be humble and be looking out for the interests of others. Being claimed by Christ sets us free and settles that desire for each of us to find meaning in life. We find our meaning following Christ and serving others. Those without Christ are always looking for meaning. They look for it in accomplishments or success or wealth. The things that King Solomon called chasing after the wind. There was a fascinating article in Touchstone magazine entitled Pupils Delighted. It was written by Anthony Esselin, who was a professor at Providence College. Esselin remembers setting through a graduation address by a professor who was totally secular in his outlook. This man had no use for poetry, prose, art, or faith. Says Esselin, he concluded his short acceptance speech by declaring that he had no doubt that the honorees in attendance would make us proud. This they would do by earning high scores on standardized tests or obtaining internships or fellowships or distinguishing themselves in musical or theatrical competitions, or winning admission to prestigious schools. At that moment, all the secularist was talking about were the trappings of success. But Esalen says, about what you learn and what life you lead, and where you are going, he has nothing to say. This way of thinking bothered Esalen. He wondered, how could the speaker miss the real stuff of life? He was still thinking about that speech when 
he started checking out some obituaries in his college magazine. This time he said, I read several of the obituaries coming, combing through them to see if I could find a single reference to the faith of the graduate. His devotion to God made manifest in his love of family and neighbor. Nothing. Not from the class of 1939 clear to the class of 1990. It was as if that whole dimension of human life, some people call it depth, I call it reality, did not exist. Instead, the obituaries were full of the usual praise for worldly achievements. Everyone's supposed to do very important things, like winning a piano contest, or publishing in Harvard Law, or being elected Speaker of the House for South Dakota. No one is eulogized for merely loving a spouse and children, and certainly not for bending his knees in prayer. Brothers and sisters, I think that Professor Esselin is on to something here. I think the questions that Paul is asking us today in our text are, are serious, and we need to pause and think about them. Does being a Christian really make us different from other people? Yes, it should. One huge way is in that what we believe makes life worthwhile and valuable. What we believe enables a person to feel as if they're doing okay so that we can look at our life in light of Christ and say, not bad, not bad at all. Of course, the secular world around us has a ready answer for what gives meaning. It's your performance. It's how well you do at what the world considers important. It's how far you progress as compared to others in your field. As Professor Esselin says, very important things like winning a piano contest or publishing in Harvard Law or being elected Speaker of the House for South Dakota. Or in high school, it's being all state or being a starter or a class president. Are those the sorts of things that we need to earn the air we breathe? Are these the types of things we yearn for? Or yearn that our children will do or be? Well, God help us if it is, because we are missing the point of what it means to be a Christian. Jesus, talking to his disciples in Matthew 16, said, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus says the world just does not get it. The world is wandering around lost. It's not how much wealth you can accumulate. It's not how many times your picture appears in the paper or the degrees that you earn. Those are all fine. But Jesus says that life is really not about all of that. That in the end, they are without permanent meaning. Death will end them all. Paul says, let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. We can truly look to the interests of others when we're not worried about our own interests, when we know that we're okay. Professor Esselin again, what finally is the point of education? My colleague on the stage measures the success of education in material terms, or perhaps I should just say he measures its success. There's a great danger here for us to measure life by its success if the world is defining what we mean by success. I mean, look at the Apostle Paul. He's sitting in prison 
when he wrote to the Philippians. Not very successful. And yet, he was full of good news. He was optimistic. He believed that his imprisonment was turning out to be a good thing because he knew what life is really all about. Is there any any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort in His love? See, Paul expects to hear a ringing yes to these questions. Encouragement from belonging to Christ. Comfort in His love. Do we answer yes with gusto? Or has the world gotten to us? Once more, Professor Esselin. A woman wrote to me this spring quite out of of the blue. She graduated in 1992 and had taken a class or two of mine in Renaissance literature. She had read my monthly reflections in the Catholic Missal and felt moved to thank me and send a picture of her family. She's a devout and joyous Christian, not a winner of some competition, not a doctor or a lawyer or an Indian chief, but a mother of a brood of eight beautiful children. I will be taping the picture to my office wall. When I think of her and of the students like her, so many fine people, and when the time comes and the great and mysterious final change is coming upon me, I hope that some one of them will come and visit me at my bedside and say those things the world will never understand. Things like beauty and goodness and truth. Things like hope and life and salvation. Not a doctor or a lawyer or an Indian chief, but a mother, a father, a daughter, a son, a friend, a teacher. Paul would say it this way, do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world holding fast the word of life, rejoicing in the life that we have been given in Jesus Christ. Once we were dead, and now we are alive for eternity, saved by grace and given life and true meaning. Some people are also given great worldly success, but we know that that success is not the thing that gives us life and makes us worthwhile. Our life is centered in the truth about God and about the world we live in. That little song again. Life is like a journey. Who knows where it ends? Yes, and if you need to know the measure of a man, you simply count his friends. Stop and look around you. The glory that you see is born again each day. Don't let it slip away. How precious life can be. Yes, and every night will end and every day will start with a grateful prayer and a thankful heart. Outstanding, says Paul. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also also should be glad and rejoice with me because Jesus Christ is our Lord and he has given us freedom in his forgiveness. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand and sing.